After an extremely wet weekend saw flooding hit some areas, millions will have to endure more intense downpours due to the storms. Deadly flooding across America's northeast. President Joe Biden said it was yet another reminder that these... Ex A flood warning has been declared for parts of the UK as Storm Ruby arrives on our shores. <laughs> Authorities say you should limit travel wherever huh. possible. I've heard it all now. Limit travel over a bit of bad weather. <laughs> Some of the top that. No, I didn't. Don't believe everything you hear. Why do you watch it then? What? Well, why do you watch it then? Which are all bloody channels these days? What if we get flooded? I'm not a flood risk here. Says who? Well, Roy off at road for one. What, Roy off at road who believes in Bigfoot and UFOs? Oh. Yeah, why are you still here? I thought you were going out with your mates. Maybe I should stay here. Not on my account. Go on, get off with you, you'd be late. Right. See you soon. Yeah. Have a pint for me. David Hughes. David, this is Clara Richardson from the Digital Twin Engineering team. We spoke last week. Yeah, we did. I was wondering if you'd come to a decision about what we last discussed. Like I said before, we need to create a digital twin of the whole network to identify possible failures across the system. We need all of the utilities to participate. Sure. This is about keeping the power on and services running through extreme weather events. We've got the tech. We just need to share data across our organizations. I absolutely understand, but you requested confidential asset data from us. Data licensing processes are complex. Oh no. Come on. But we currently have our own emergency systems in place anyway. We are taking responsibility for this. Look, for this to work, we need to connect the entire system together. Not only is this about businesses and services staying online, it's a matter of life and death. It's that critical. Yeah. We have a whole list of critical priorities. Storm Ruby is due to hit. It's going to be catastrophic. Is there anything we can do to speed this process up? It could take six months, a year even. <laughs> Look, Storm Ruby, this is climate change. I understand. My mother lost her home during the floods last year. We've got to do everything we can. David? Hello? Listen, Clara. Brenda! Brenda, it's bloody! Grandad! I'll make it work. We're in now. Thank you. Thank you. It's been one week since Storm Ruby hit the UK. With the worst of the bad weather now behind us, the great cleanup has begun.
No slippers. Carbon neutral then. Roy's got some at all. We are in a climate emergency and it affects all of us, especially the most vulnerable. But all is not lost if we adapt now and make better climate resilience decisions. The National Digital Twin Programme is developing a connected digital twin called Credo, which is making connections across our utility networks in a way that could save lives in the future. But this will only happen if we share data between organisations. Collaboration is key to tackling climate change. We must act now. Wow, what a fantastic video to start this session off with. Um, really great messages. I'm, I'm kind of a bit relieved that Grandad didn't die at the end. That would have been rather intense otherwise. But it touches on some of the key things that we're seeing across industry at the moment and really what we have to do to address those challenges. So my name is Simon Evans. I'm the Digital Energy Leader at Arup. I'm also responsible for what Arup's doing around digital twins. Um, I've been working very closely with the Centre for Digital Bill Britain and the National Digital Twin Programme for a number of years and currently chair their Gemini call, which is the weekly stand-up call where we share knowledge and findings with all of industry. And I'll be hosting today's webinar on Credo. So the agenda today, we've got a packed agenda for the time we've got. We're going to start off first hearing from Sarah Hayes, who's going to introduce the project, talk about what's happening and what it means and why we're doing it. And then we're going to hear about the technical developments from Tom before going into interview with our, our main contributors and um, asset owners associated with the programme. And then finally on to Q&A at the end, where we'll be capturing and answering questions from yourselves, the audience who are listening with us today. First, there are a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, of course, we're doing this virtually and we want to make sure that we give airtime for all of our speakers, but also for yourselves to ask those questions. So please use the Q&A functions built into Zoom. We'll be taking those questions and then sending them to the speakers when we get to the Q&A session. This will also be recorded and shared publicly afterwards. So if you want to comment anonymously, if that's required or preferred, you absolutely can do. And finally, of course, please, if you are following along, do use social media and use hashtag Credo and hashtag NDT program to make sure we can publicize and share this widely and the great insights and knowledge we're gonna to discuss today. So with that as a starter, I'm first gonna hand over to Sarah Hayes, who's the Credo program lead, and will be introducing the project to us. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Simon. And thank you everyone who has joined this webinar and watched the film with us. We're really delighted to share this film with you today as COP26 gets underway, and we hope that you'll share it with your friends and colleagues to inspire them to act now. If you didn't get to see it all at the beginning, then you can watch it on the DT Hub from midday. I, I believe that everyone at this webinar wants to do everything we can to help people like Clara and Grandad. And that's why we've come together today to collaborate and hopefully to find out more about Credo, our climate resilience demonstrator project. Credo is the demonstrator project for the National Digital Twin Programme to show how it's possible to use the information management framework approach to pull data sets together across sectors into a digital twin that can help to improve the level of resilience that we have to extreme weather caused by climate change. It's a climate change adaptation digital twin. In Credo, we're connecting data sets across Anglian Water, BT and UK power networks to better understand the interdependencies across the whole infrastructure system. We're looking at the impact of possible future flooding on these infrastructure interdependencies to help us understand how to protect the system and to adapt to climate change. Tom is going to talk more about the technical detail of Credo, but hopefully it's enough for me to say now that Credo is intended to help make decisions that will improve resilience across the system, not just across individual networks, to keep people like Grandad safe. This is about ensuring that we make the right decisions to protect parts of these networks that will maximize resilience across the whole infrastructure system. So I'm gonna show you this app that we've developed to show what a digital twin like Credo can do. Before I get into the app, I will say 
that I've learned by working with the excellent team at Esri that it's a lot of work to create fictional maps and to make fictional digital twins, as of course in Credo, we're working with confidential data, which is stored securely on the Daphne platform. So in the app, we've had to create the data for a fictional version. And it reminds me that this all comes back to data and to making sure in the real versions that we can share data for the public good. So I'd like to introduce this fictional Sunford city to you. Kirsten, if you could play the video, please. After a series of recent storms, Sunford Park is recovering from localised utility outages. Repairs were ongoing but have now been postponed as Storm Ruby approaches. As the storm hits the city, heavy rainfall causes the river to flood in parts of Sunford Park. Local telecoms are damaged, making reporting and response difficult. Large areas of the city are without power, as distribution and primary substations are damaged. The power outage also brings down a wastewater pumping station, causing sewage to flood into the homes of Sunford residents. As the evening approaches, flood levels begin to recede and recovery efforts can increase. Several utilities are able to recover using temporary measures. Recovery efforts continue into the morning of the second day. However, by midday, a storm surge combines with high river flows and floods to a new area of the city. This flood brings down a primary substation, causing a general power outage, severe telecoms disruption and a disrupted freshwater supply. By the end of day two, Sunford Park Hospital is suffering from communication and water outages and vulnerable households have been left without services. The storm that hit Sunford City was unprecedented, but a changing climate makes such events more likely. Understanding the interconnected infrastructure system networks that serve our towns and cities can help us prepare for extreme weather and flooding and adapt to climate change. Through Credo, the National Digital Twin Programme is creating a demonstration of how this is possible. So you can see that this storm ruby has caused a lot of damage. The whole power network is down, comms is down and Sunford City is without clean water and the hospital is suffering from communications and water outages. Your role is to act now to protect Sunford City against this kind of storm happening in the future and to make decisions to protect certain assets to keep the lights on, communications going and water running. So you can see in the next slide that you can click on assets to reveal what they are. So you can see here that this is a clean water booster pumping station. What I like about this app is that you can have a go yourself, you can show it to your CEO, or you could leave it with your kids to play around with. We've developed this app with Esri and with expert input from Mott McDonald and the asset owners over a period of just eight weeks. We only just started this at the beginning of September. And I can see how this could even be turned into a high resolution computer game, which could appeal to teenagers who want to move from Lego into the digital world and test out solutions to climate change. So in the app, which has a mobile, a tablet and a desktop version, here you're invited to play the part of the water company, but you only have the information available to you about your own network and you don't have access to any data about what's going on with the power or the comms networks. So you are limited in the effectiveness of your possible interventions because you can't see the interdependencies with power and communications. So your level of resilience remains low. But if you join up all the data across the networks, like in the Credo connected digital twin that we're creating, you can see the connections across all the networks. So now with all this information in front of you, you have a different set of options. You can play the role of resilience planner across the infrastructure system to see what are the options that will maximize resilience and at least cost. You can see here that the primary substation in Sidley is really critical as it supplies up to 17 other assets with power. So you could investigate what the effect would be if you moved that substation. If you choose this option, 
you can see the effects across the network in your dashboard in the bottom right corner there, and that there would be no disruption at the hospital, but there are still some vulnerable people who would be affected by the loss of power in the Sunford Park area in the bottom right of the map. So I will leave the rest to you for you to investigate the choices that you would make to plan ahead and protect Sunford City against the kind of storms that we're going to see due to climate change. And at the end, you get a nice summary showing the trade-offs between the options looking at resilience and cost. As of course, your consumers may not be willing to pay for the maximum level of resilience and you will need to work out across the system what your consumers are willing to pay for. The app is available online through the DT Hub from midday today, so I hope you'll enjoy having a go, and we're always open to suggestions about how to improve it. And of course, Credo is a major collaboration across government, industry, and academia, much like the National Digital Twin Programme. I want to say a big thank you to the asset owners who are involved, Anglian Water, BT, and UK Power Networks, because without the asset owners, we wouldn't have any data. And without data, there is no credo. Our key message through the film and the app is that collaboration through connected digital twins is key to tackling climate change. And this collaboration is evident in the team working together on credo. Without the asset owners, as I said, there is no data. And without the data, there is no credo. The asset owners themselves are the reason for Credo and the means to adapting to climate change. And it is their people and expertise that form a crucial part of Credo. Without our funders, Bayes, UKRI, and, you can, and Connected Places Catapult, there wouldn't be any research to talk about today. Without Hartree and the research institutions, CMCL Innovations, the Information Management Framework Team, and the Joint Centre of Excellence in Environmental Intelligence, there won't be a Credo Digital Twin. So it is their clever work behind the scenes that will make Credo happen. Without Mott McDonald and Esri, we wouldn't have this app. And of course, without the team at Crocodile Media, we wouldn't have this film, which I hope resonates long after today. We are all one team working to a common goal, and that is to build connected digital twins to help us adapt to climate change. And if we can adapt through connected digital twins, then we can also mitigate. All of us here care about granddad and his grandson, Jack, and we all want to make it, we all want to work together to make a difference to people's lives now and in the future. So we think it's important to get some messages out this week and next at COP26 that there are technologies like connected digital twins that we can use now to help us tackle climate change. Rachel, our project manager for the Credo project, will be at the UKRI stand in the Green Zone at COP26 in Glasgow next week on Thursday, the 11th of November. So if you're there, please go along and say hello to Rachel. We also have Chris and Gavin from the technical team joining the webinar live from Glasgow today. So hopefully we will hear more from them later on. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks so much, Sarah. And um, I think it's fantastic that from midday to day, you'll be able to try out that app and actually play it for yourself. And what's really powerful about it is it's accessible and available to be interpreted by all age groups and all people, which is really, really good. So next, we're going to hand over to Tom. And Tom is the technical architect for Credo. He's from the Hartree Foundation, which is part of the Science and Technology Facilities Council. So over to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Simon. And hi, everyone. So as I said, my name is Tom Collingwood. I'm the Credo Technical Architect, which means I get the joy of following on from the excellent film and app with the least glamorous part of the webinar, but uh, we're just keeping it to a few slides. So what is Credo uh, at, a, at a technical level? Really, this is the first step along a much bigger journey. So we, the film and the demo of the app show you where we want to get to. It's my job to coordinate the technical side of our next few steps on that journey. To get started, we've narrowed down our scope to something small enough to deliver upon, and then we're going to iteratively improve on that. So we're focusing on this single use case to prove out the concept, but everything we're doing, we're intending to be foundational and we're expanding upon that in future iterations. And I think it's worth saying that we're not looking to replace network resilience planners. We're building a tool to help inform and supplement their decision-making process. 
And we're hoping that giving them that sight of the other network assets and, and the connections and interdependencies helps them to make more joined up resilience plans across industries. So this very much isn't about removing people from, from uh, these industries. It's, it's about giving them better information to, to do their jobs more effectively. It's really easy to focus on the visualization side of this, um, and that's the bit that sells most. Um, but really, 90% of the work we're doing is in the back end. So we're talking about data interoperability, plumbing, modeling, all of the stuff that you can see on the right hand side of, of the slide, really. It's a very high level schematic that roughly outlines what we're doing. So at a, at a at high level, we're taking climate projection data, which looks at what, what the climate could be like in the future. We're mapping that through, through flooding models to, to flood conditions and flood scenarios. And we're gonna put that up against data from the asset owners, which we have to extract and transform. Um, and so we figure out what, we know where the assets are, we know what they look like, can we work out if they've flooded or not? Once we know if they've flooded, we can calculate the impact within their individual networks. And that's giving us the sort of information that you could have got to as an individual um, asset owner already, I guess. But it is that, that final step where we join them all together and we show the impact across the networks where we see the value there. Because it may be that even though your own assets haven't flooded, some of the assets that supply power or communication or cooling water to your own asset might have gone down in a flood. <clears throat> so where you thought you were safe, turns out you might not actually. So that's the what, but what about the, the when? So we're actively working on this stuff right now. Uh, by right now, I mean technical work is ongoing and we have our prototype system development underway. Uh, we aim to develop, finish that by the end of December this year. We've then got some additional technical work in January, which will be ramping down at that point. Um, and we're working through into wrap up and dissemination in February and March next year. Um, and the, the whole thing will be, be wrapped up for, for the end of the financial year. By we, and Sarah's already touched on this, but um, just I'd echo those thanks. So we're really lucky to have three really engaged and very patient asset owners who are devoting technical staff time to helping us to develop that meaningful first output and make this useful. Uh, Mark McDonald as well have been really generous in bringing um, domain expertise into the technical work. And as Sarah mentioned, we've got the information management framework. So Borough Solutions and Telecent are the, the work will be covered at a later webinar on the IMF, but um, in short, it's what makes it easy for us to connect up more systems and for this to scale in future. It's about it, enabling that data interoperability and also enabling sort of permissioned data sharing across organizations, which is, is a key element and a key enabler in, in making a, a connected digital twin work at a national scale. The next two levels above that on the diagram, effectively, we have a kind of platform and infrastructure level. So CMCL are providing the dynamic knowledge graph that sits underneath everything that we do. So that represents all of the assets and everything that's happening to them. As I said, the Hartree Center where I work is, is providing um, not only myself as a technical architect, but also research software engineers and data scientists to support the other work streams. Uh, Daphne, the, the data and analytics facility for national infrastructure platform is where we're it's our secure environment where we're hosting all the information and doing all the model development and model serving at the end. And the connected places Catapult have um, got, a, in addition to bringing CMCL in, are also putting data science effort into this. And then the universities and the Met Office across the top are doing some of the interesting modeling work directly. So the University of Edinburgh is looking at that uh, system of systems modeling and how you bring full systems, well, how they fall over and how you bring them back up. Exeter and the Met Office jointly have the, the Joint Center of Excellence in Environmental Intelligence. So that's where we're getting our flood information and everything to do with the, the climate projection data. And Warwick and Newcastle are collectively doing some expert elicitation work, which we'll come on to in a second. It's a really big team across a massive number of organizations and most of us have never met in person, um, but despite that we've already come quite a long way together in this project. Um, so a couple of slides, thank you. Uh, this is a, it's been a collaborative journey. We've encountered some, some challenges on the way, some of which we expected, um, some of them have been quite novel. So the first one was, was scope. So we had a bunch of talented people in different organizations and we had to really draw the line somewhere to make this deliverable in, a, in this sort of project timeframes. So initially just figuring out where to draw the line was something we had to do a lot of work with. Secondly, uh, legal agreements. So that, that comment about it being six to 12 months to get data sharing agreements in the film, it's, it's not a throwaway comment, that, that is real and that, and that happened. So it took a long time for us to get the information collected on the data on the asset owner side, but also shared with us and in, in, in a way that everyone was comfortable with. 
participation is next. So uh, there's a socio-technical element to this project and we're building tools to facilitate data sharing and connectivity, but the best tools in the world aren't enough without people to get involved and to, to help us drive what they look like and also to help use them as well. So we, we ensure that what we're doing is effective. Now, digital twin development often includes validation of some sort against existing data. So you, you build the model of the system, you test it out in cyberspace, you test it out in the real world, and you, and you check that the two align. So you know that your digital twin is roughly aligned. Now, we can't, we can't simulate a flood in 2050 and then throw some real data at it to check it because we don't have any floods from 2050 to check yet. So we're having to work with um, a couple of different validation strategies there, but one of which is expert validation. So we're getting domain experts from Mott McDonald to help with making sure our outputs from flood modeling seem sensible. And the second strategy we have is around uncertainty quantification. So we're not just looking at giving an exact measure of the flood will be here. We're giving a rough estimate, some confidence around that to say the flood is probably going to be here and it's going to be somewhere between this size and that size. And this is the, a quantification of how much we don't know in the assumptions that have been made in the way into um, to giving you those numbers. So we're not giving hard and fast figures that would be misleading. It has to be a little bit more subtle than that. Now the data wasn't all sat ready to go waiting on the asset owner side of it. It often sits in multiple systems with different schema and it needed extracting and manually joining together to begin with. Some of that data wasn't in systems and was in reports and needed to be extracted as well. And some of it wasn't even in a written form at all. Some of this is expert knowledge that sits in people's heads. And that's where, as I mentioned earlier, Warwick and Newcastle are, are leading this work um, in expert elicitation. So this is a kind of structured interviewing process to get information out of the technical experts, both at the asset owners and with the, the domain experts at Mark McDonald's. Um, so we can turn what exists in experts' heads into probabilistic models that we can then fit into our computational workflow. It's a really interesting area of work, and I think it's something that can add a lot of value where you don't necessarily have all the data written down in a system, but you can still get something quite meaningful out of it. It's, it's quite a novel approach to this. Sarah mentioned security, and we are working with national infrastructure data here, so we've, we've been very careful on that. And obviously, I won't go into specifics, but we have a secure cluster where everything is uh, hosted and all of our development work is being done and we've it took quite a bit of time to get there but that, that's some learnings that we've got and we can share those as well after the project um, and the final one that's it's a really emergent one for us at the moment is looking at future plans so we've got a lot of information about what the network looks like today but when you're looking at what might be happening in a few decades time what's the network going to look like then and how do you make your future plans for what your network is going to look like fit with the data that tells you what your current network is so you can build models and and ensure that you're working on information that that is useful for the time period that we're looking at so we've come a long way through all of this um, but the value doesn't stop there uh, we've got one eye on the bigger picture the whole time we're doing this so uh, some of the stuff that is really valuable today already is stuff like data visibility so the asset owners have said to us that actually they haven't seen their data looking like this in the past. You know, they can see their own view, but, but being able to see how their data and their, their assets look in relation to everyone else's, that's novel in itself. And that adds value before we even get to the modeling side. We also had a bit of a light bulb moment where um, we were talking to the asset owners about how everything runs within the industry. Um, and they were talking about the service level agreements that they have to sign up to with their individual regulators. Now, once you start looking at this as a mesh, as an interconnected net set of networks, having each of them individually talking to individual regulators who set targets on how everything works feels a little bit like it's not quite joined up anymore. Um, so starting to play into the conversation around how we look at the full system of systems view and what that might mean for regulators as well as for the operators. I've talked about expert elicitation, and I think that's already of some value in the project, but the more conversations we have, the more data that we're, we're going to derive from that. And that's a really big part of um, getting more value both now and in future. We'll also be releasing some information about the methodology and our findings so other people can use that in future. And we're also synthesizing data and releasing our code. So we can't release the asset owner data, but we want to be able to make our outputs available to people. So to do that, we'll create synthetic data so you can take what we've developed and you can run it on a representative data set. And that'll help people to get up to speed with where we are, start seeing how our systems work and look at building that up and, and enabling uptake and scale on across different industries and, and different applications as well. 
But finally, when we talk about value, we're not really talking about a financial measure here. I think we spend a lot of time talking about assets and networks, which is, they're incredibly clinical terms. Um, but I like the film for bringing this back to what we're really talking about, which is keeping homes and schools and hospitals online. We're talking about people, uh, and that's what matters at the end of the day. So in summary, uh, we're working on this right now and we're excited about it. Uh, we've got a lot to do in a short space of time, but we're building everything with one eye on future extensibility. We'll be releasing our work alongside a synthetic data set so other people can join us soon on the technical journey. And some of the lessons we've learned so far have nothing to do with technology, um, but we'll try and share those as best we can as well. So that's everything from me. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thanks so much, Tom. That's much appreciated. So we're now joined by a selection of individuals who have been involved in the Credio program. First, our asset owners, Tom from Anglian Water, Louise from BT, and Matt from UK Power Networks. But also we're joined by Tamar as well from the Connected Places platform, who are the Credo project funders. So a couple of questions to the four of you, please. If we can start with yourself, Louise. I'm wondering, <clears throat> why did you get involved in the Credo project? What was the reason behind it? So um, my day job is basically um, looking at um, how we can react to climate change and how we can avoid climate change. And, um, you know, we're very aware we provide critical national infrastructure that's um, most, most in demand at the same time when it's most at risk of failure. And we know from past events that coordination on the ground between different teams when you're recovering from an event is critical. Um, so, uh, and we know that digital twins internally are helping us make better decisions, make better planning decisions. Um, so doesn't it make sense that if we rely on that coordination actually in an emergency, if we can bring that degree of coordination together beforehand in the planning and design stages, we may be able to design a system that's more resilient. And that's essentially what's, what's driving us to be involved. But I kind of hope that, you know, we, we go beyond just looking at flooding and resilience to flooding events, but to a wider range of climate change events. And also perhaps to use the same thinking to help us as a country um, avoid climate change and, and, and make decisions that help reduce our overall carbon footprint. So that's essentially why, why BT's got involved. Brilliant, well, that's really great. And um, Tamar, from your perspective in the Connected Places Catapult, what was the reason that yourself got involved? Hi, yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, so Connected Places Catapult, we're the UK's innovation accelerator for transport cities and place leadership. And we're very much a kind of enabling organization. So we work across government, academia, industry um, to support kind of connected places of the future. Um, and we really focus on tackling barriers to innovation um, and supporting kind of places and, and challenge owners to access the UK's innovators, both academics and in um, startups and scale-ups. So a key strategic focus for us as uh, sort of in the name connected places looking at integrated infrastructure um, and we very much see a kind of future of evolving interdependence and coupling um, demanding a collaborative approach to managing infrastructure as a system of systems so for example um, with the production of hydrogen as a future fuel requiring requiring water and, and clean energy as inputs and with increasing uptake of electric vehicles affecting demand on the grid um, so so this kind of increased coupling adds further to the importance of a system of systems approach to climate resilience planning. Um, I think the Credo film and I've already done a really good job of bringing that, that to life. Um, so we're involved in Credo to break down barriers to collaboration and to data sharing, as kind of Tom highlighted. It's a, a, a theme is kind of data sharing taking a long time. Um, and it's increasingly important uh, in a kind of integrated infrastructure context. Um, so also in our sort of uh, role showcasing UK's innovators, we've bought CMCL Innovations um, uh, as a kind of data engineering digital twin partner to the project so that they can kind of showcase their technology um, and uh, uh, hopefully kind of we're, we're looking to connect that sort of technology showcase to, to the asset owners that are on this panel here so that they can call to sort of see see what's out there and, and collaborate with some of the kind of up and coming innovators um, to get that sort of thing moving for the future. Brilliant, thanks so much. And um, Tom, from your perspective in Anglian Water, what have you learned so far through your involvement in the Credo programme? Uh, well, I mean, the Credo programme uh, really hit, um, hits the spot for me because I work across the enterprise data and uh, carbon neutrality team. So there's learning on all fronts here, but 
Um, we're maybe focusing on the information management framework, which is an approach that's underpinning the uh, the kind of technical side of things. Uh, so we've been uh, hopefully contributing, but but absolutely learning from that. Uh, and a little bit like Louise just said, um, we we're on a journey ourselves around trying to develop our internal digital twin. And so the uh, the data interoperability challenges that you see uh, externally, you'll, you'll also see those internally. So there are very immediate lessons that we can learn from that this this process. Um, but absolutely, the, the the idea of having to have uh, cross sector collaboration uh, is absolutely essential for for dealing with these uh, global global problems. Um, and so, yeah, overcoming that that data interoperability challenge between asset owners uh, making data sharing um, frictionless is is absolutely something that we're we're uh, wanting to learn more about. Um, but also with the information management framework, we've uh, recently uh, received funding from Offwat uh, for our safe smart systems, uh, and that's actually going to be building further upon the information management framework that we're hopefully learning from here. Uh, we'll be sharing that with the the wider water industry. So yeah, huge opportunity for learning. That's brilliant. And um, from UK Power Network's perspective, Matt, what about yourselves? What have you learned from being involved so far in, in Credo? Um, so, so building on Tom's points, uh, which you know resonate with ourselves, I'm sure with, with uh, BT also, um, it reflects a, a lot on Credo and similar uh, projects that are dependent on data sharing, that it's not just a technical challenge that we need to overcome. Uh, and I think the learnings that we've had as we go through this project are really emphasise that, yes, there are challenges in terms of standardisation of data and interoperability, which, which are absolutely key to success. But sometimes the more difficult things to overcome are the, the less technical aspects. So uh, the legal components, governance and cultural change, even all, all those uh, things that sit below the waterline and, and are sometimes are, are slightly invisible uh, when you're implementing these sorts of projects and programmes have, have really come to the surface. And again, we, we, I'm sure we'll keep using the word a lot through this conversation, that collaborative coordination um, that you need to overcome those um, hurdles um, is, is really, really key. If, if we're not joined up in how we address those problems, then every time we try to undertake this type of, type of initiative, we're going to um, move too slowly and, 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 and potentially fail. Uh, so, you know, the learnings that we have from this initiative are really, really important in how it scales and evolves over time. And that's valuable to us not only in the context of what we're doing here and now, but in the broader context of, of open data and how we move forward into uh, a digitally enabled set of uh, infrastructure networks. Absolutely, and kind of following questions yourself then, Matt, where do you see Credo heading then? Um, I think it, it's important to reflect on what uh, Tom mentioned earlier around um, Credo is just the start. It's that first, uh, small step really into something that's going to be potentially quite huge and 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 something that they shouldn't have a defined end because it, it's 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 almost nebulous when you think about where it could go so clearly there are future potential use cases within the environmental context but building on that hopefully by developing something that takes away some of the mystique around digital twins uh something very conceptual providing something tangible that people can see and interact with and understand that will trigger new thoughts and ideas about how this will de develop and evolve and be applied in new, new ways within the environmental context and beyond. Um, so I think that's one important piece. The other aspect is how do we make sure we attract other network operators. You've got ourselves at UK Power Networks, Angling Water and BT coming together in this instance, but clearly that's a drop in the ocean compared to the number of infrastructure owners and asset operators uh, at a national scale and beyond, especially when you think about interconnectivity with, with Europe uh, and, and elsewhere that needs to be factored into this as well. So again, hopefully we'll see the direction of travel be an increasing number of use cases, but also an increasing number of participants, more diverse data sets and, and greater value being derived. Absolutely. I, I love the idea there. Of it's the, much more the show me rather than the tell me. We hear a lot of people telling people how good digital twins are, but we're really demonstrating it here, which is, which is absolutely yeah. fantastic. And um, Tamar, finishing with yourself for this segment, where do you see Credo going as connected places Credipol? Um, I, I think what Matt's described there is a really, really fantastic vision. So I think kind of moving from uh, kind of continuing to find use cases that really uh, kind of uh, engage multiple asset owners so that we can kind of increasingly um, bring other, bring other uh, network operators in. Um, and I think kind of really keen to explore pushing um, Credo as a project from a, something that's, that's a demonstration and is a kind of like show not tell piece, but into something that's a kind of operationalized 
decentralized collaborative decision support lab. Um, so kind of really taking it to that next step and um, creating some evidence around the kind of change decisions yeah. that can be made using digital twins and connected digital twins. Brilliant. No, so, and we're on such an exciting journey that's uh, started today, or well, before today, but of course launched to you all today with our, our great video that we encourage you all to share. So thank you very much to our uh, panellists there of Tom, Louise, Matt and Tamar. We're now going to move on to the Q&A section. We've got a wider group of panellists joining and I'd encourage everyone who's attending and the audience of this call to please use the Q&A feature of Zoom to ask your questions and then we'll pitch them to our panel as we go through that way to make sure we can answer all the questions within the time we've got. So joining us on the panel today, we have Chris Dent, who's the technical lead from Edwin University, and Gavin, who's joining the, from the Joint Centre of Excellence in Environmental Intelligence at University of Exeter. Gavin and Chris are both joining us live from COP26 today, which is fantastic. We've got Audrey from um, Mott McDonald, Robin from the Hartree Centre, Gavin Starks from Icebreaker One, Amit from CMCL Innovations, David from Mott McDonald's, and Charles from Esri. So thanks for joining us all today. Absolutely fantastic to have you here. Um, whilst I allow all of our attendees to ask a couple more questions, I'm just going to fit, pitch our first question, which is actually to Sarah Hayes, who's also joining us on the panel. So Sarah, over to yourself, how can people get involved in Credo? OK, so how to get involved in Credo? I think there are two ways. One is very, fairly simple one is more involved. So the simple way really is to share the Credo film and share the Credo app. We're really looking to spread the message today that um, collaboration through connected digital twins is key to tackling climate change. So we really want to get that message out there. So supporting us by sharing the film and the app is, is one way. Um, and joining the, the DT Hub as well in terms of following the progress of um, Credo, what Tom has talked about earlier in terms of sharing the lessons learned as we go. Then the more involved way of getting involved in Credo is, is really about how do we scale um, Credo? And, and I think you know what Matt and Tamar have just been touching upon there. So I think there are different perspectives. So there's the funder perspective in terms of contributing to further phases of Credo and expansion of Credo to other assets, regions, and sectors. Of course, what we're doing here is we're just looking at one small area in East Anglia, that's sort of, it, it's a pilot project, but we want to be able to scale this up. And what we're doing in the app, it's sort of a very much a fictional version of, of what is, we're doing in real life. And, and uh, what's happening in, in real life is it, it, we're using confidential data. So that's why we've created the app to sort of create, to tell the story about what we're doing. I think from the asset owner perspective, it, it would be ideal, you know, the, the, the idea there is to get together with other asset owners, you know, what, what Matt, Louise and Tom have been able to do here is fantastic, I think, in sort of making those cross-sector connections. So I think it's getting together with other asset owners to make up, to, to set up your own version of Credo. And then I think from the supplier perspective, both commercial and academic, it's really about teaming up with, with the asset owners to develop a Credo connected digital twin, because ultimately we want this to scale. We want it to go to other sectors and other regions. Um, and, and other countries, but it's, it's, it's going to be a journey. Brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. Our next question from the audience is to David, and the question is, David, as both the films and the app feature a flood risk scenario, how much involvement has the environmental agency had in the development, and have you considered their open asset data in the model? Yes, <clears throat> good question, Simon. So, uh, for, for, the, for the app and the film, I mean, the, the case has been fictional, so we have picked a fictional location and we have used open uh, data to create the flooding scenario. Uh, but moving forward in the technical world that is happening now, uh, we will, of course, uh, make use of the available EA models uh, because they have put a lot of effort to, to be de develop those um, across the country. We will utilize those uh, wherever possible. But also we will go beyond uh, because we're going to be looking at things like uncertainty, as Tom Collingwood uh, mentioned before. Um, so we will be looking at, um, at understanding uh, how certain the, the estimation of the, of the flat uh, is at uh, different locations. We will also be able to, to do uh, things dynamically. We, use, we will not just uh, look at the static uh, design for the events. We will have to understand how the, the changes in the frequency, seasonality, spatial distribution of flats can affect uh, the different assets. And also we are looking at the moment to, 
to improve uh, the surface uh, water flooding maps that are available in the, in the region because we recognize that that's an area that has been flagged to us by but, uh, some of the asset owners that they are concerned about this uh, source of flooding. So we are looking at improve the, the food maps that are available from this source. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And um, Tom, to, Tom Collingwood, this is Tom to yourself. How much effort is in deriving and creating these synthetic databases? And does the synthetic data sets reduce integrity of future digital twin developments? I.e. to what context level can the synthetic data sets be used? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so there is a fair amount of effort in, in creating a synthetic data set, not in creating one necessarily, because that's that's something we could relatively easily um, create. The, the problem is that we don't want to encode any sensitive information from the data that we have. So if we're deriving one from the asset owner information we've been given, we want to make sure that our synthetic data looks representative, has the kind of uh, connections that you'd expect, but doesn't end up um, leaking any private information about the asset owners themselves. So we're having to be very careful with how we do that and how we review that data before we release it. In terms of how useful it is and, and where the, the extent of the limitations of, of what you can do with it, the way we see this being used is, is it's an enabler for us to share the code that we've got so people can reproduce our approaches. So it, it shows that what we've got can work and other people can try it. It would enable you to try out, say, if you were coming from a, a fourth industry and you wanted to, to tease out some connections across the two, it will give you enough to work with them to, to check where those power connections might come from, for example. But it wouldn't be enough to support any kind of live system. Um, and, and we would see that the, the natural step there would be for someone to use the, the synthetic data to get their heads around the approach and to start understanding how to work with this. But then it'd be a conversation and, and it'd be approaching the asset owners and the existing system to effectively look at how you would then hook into more of a live system to get real data that, that works for, for a real use case. That's where Telecent are, are a really big addition for the project as well. So they're kind of enabling that federated access of data across networks. Um, so we see that as kind of you know future development. It's something that's still very much in the pipeline rather than being ready to roll immediately. But um, yeah, the synthetic data is there so people can try it out in a sandbox environment, but, but it would be very much then a case of approaching people who are already on the system to, to figure out how to hook up with, with the real version of the data and, and start working with the, the, the real thing. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. And to Robin, so all utilities are different regulations and cyber threat processes. How could this be considered? It's an interesting question. There's a couple of related questions I've seen in the, in the, in the question forum around this. Um, it, it, first and foremost, we built this in at the start of the project. Um, it was part of the legal agreement. Um, each of the organisations have their own regulations around this, um, as do the, the, the organisations that are providing, well, one staff and to the infrastructure around this. Um, it is, so, so whilst um, cybersecurity is very important, one of the big challenges here is how do we reduce the barrier in those signing, in those, in signing those agreements? Um, I, I think it was Louise who mentioned it earlier. I think that this is something that needs to be an ongoing process with utilities um, and asset, asset owners uh, and needs to be set up before we're in these emergency situations. Um, I, I think one of the, the, the key things that we've learned, and we all knew this walking into the project as well, is that this takes a, an inordinate amount of time to set up, much, much longer than you might imagine. Um, and and, and it, it's, it's, it's no one issue that's, that's, that's the problem here. Everybody wants to be careful with data. It, is, it, it has a value um, and to different organizations. So I think that the, the, the big message that we've learned here is that this needs to be set up in advance. And actually if we had pre-signed agreements um, and there was something standard around those, that one protects the cyber securities, but two enables freedom to act, um, that, would, that would at least lower some of the barriers that we've seen in Credo. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. And um, Amit, our next question is to you. So could you comment on the challenges around creating a federated ecosystem of digital twins which can interact with each other, first potentially creating a walled garden digital twin so they don't really talk to each other? Is this kind of organic interoperability really a pipe dream? So um, 
I, I think that the, the problem comes in if you have this one way of dealing with it, then you create information silos and we want to exactly avoid that problem. So we want to be able to communicate seamlessly between these digital twins and need to connect the digital twins. So the knowledge graph approach and using the semantics, uh, this enables um, us to A, scale it, and B, go across the domains or across the uh, asset owners in this case, or the infrastructure domains in this case. Fair enough. Oh, very good. Thanks, Amit. And um, come back to yourself, Tom Collingwood. Uh, what security protocols are being applied to Credo? So there's a number of different areas where we're enforcing security here. Some technical, some, some legal, some, some sort of uh, procedural. Uh, I don't want to get into specifics too much on this, but um, effectively the, the way that we're working is in a secure sandboxed environment. So we've taken the data from the asset owners and we've, we've got it in a secure location where we control that and we control who has access to it. That enables us to do our initial development work. And then the next step of that, once we've got it all in one place, which was you know, kind of overcomes some of the frictions of getting that data out of systems in the first place, we then look to supplement that by feeding in the work from the information management framework, which is that, that uh, federated access piece of this. So we start with everything, we build it so we can we know that the end-to-end -end integration works. And then at the end, we basically pull the data out of it in this format that it currently is. And we spin up another sandboxed environment to effectively simulate having kind of nodes within a network. So one at Anglian Water, one at BT, one at UK Power Networks. And we run that through that federated access to show how that would link into the digital twin, which means that each of the asset owners can keep control of their own data with their own security protocols on top of that um, and effectively enact that, that permissioned model to give other areas access to their data when it's needed for, for the purposes of the, of the simulation. Brilliant. Thanks very much. And Charles, from an Esri perspective, how can GIS tools help to communicate the benefits of digital twins? I think there's there's two major ways. One is the, the presentation of it, the, the visualization. Um, we all hear about climate change, we talk about digital twins, we talk about more resilience, but ultimately what many people care about, as we saw in the video, is individual people. We care about ourselves, our families, our friends, our communities. Um, so GIS can help make these things relevant to the right people, so they can help tell the story. The impact of this happening here is this to you or to your organization or to the sector you represent. So I think it can help in that storytelling and just presenting things in a very visually compelling way, but more importantly, a more personal way um, or more personal to people or to organizations. Uh, and the second way it can help is it can pull together data very quickly from multiple systems and identify stakeholders. So we can see legislation might change something in this area. Let's look at the area the legislation's in and apply it to digital twins. It can support the federated system because the only thing you need to link different systems together is a knowledge of where they are and how they interact with each other. So I think it's got different roles to play, but fundamentally it can help tell the story and can help structure and organize the content that we need. Brilliant. Thank you. And Gavin, to yourself, whose responsibility is it to ensure the data is shared to enable climate change digital twins like Credo? So that's a fantastic question. And, and as has been mentioned already, there's a, an absolute role for the public sector in this, whether it's through uh, regulated instruments to actually, in many cases, mandate that data must be shared, uh, whether it's shared as open data under an open license for anyone to use for any purpose for free. Obviously, that's a limited, uh, smaller data set, or whether it's simply you must make this available to the market using open standards in a uh, an interoperable and cohesive way. And, and the word cohesion there is as important as um, interoperable. That, that's something that can be achieved through uh, either regulatory uh, focus or I'd encourage you know, maybe a faster route to, to start putting it into procurement roles. And so if you're, if you're really looking to get this, uh, particularly when you're trying to go cross sector, it's extremely difficult as everyone has highlighted. Um, really uh, the, the ability to, to get together, collectively agree contracts, collectively agree, you know, what's the minimum viable thing we can do in the next three to six months that's going to move the project forward, build it around particular use cases and work out where they, uh, where things spit out the side of it and then address them. Again, much, much faster uh, approach. And that can then signal to regulators, okay, you, you might need to lean in here, but actually you don't need to lean in, lean in over there at all because we, we've got it in hand. So lots of different approaches, I think, based on the specific applications. 
Brilliant. That's really good. And um, Audrey, to yourself, do you think we'll start to see storms like Storm Ruby? Because that's pretty intense. What's your views on that? Thank you, Simon. So that's probably the million dollar question, really. Um, so Storm Ruby is a, is a fictional event uh, that has been created for the purpose of the public visualization. That said, um, the client science is really telling us that extreme events like Storm Ruby will become more frequent and also more in intense. So a storm like that is not off the charts. Um, there's always been, um, there's already been extreme events in the past years um, that have had catastrophic consequences really not only on infrastructures but also on communities and that's all around the world so this is sorry so this is really something that has already started to happen and um, this is climate change is not something that will start to happen in 50 years time really and the other thing that the scenario um, that Sarah has showed in the app um, is showing is that the cascading failures and the domino effect that we see uh, that lead to these dramatic consequences across the city are also triggered by multiple climate hazards that happen one after the other in a relatively short time. And that really leads to a weakening of the system. So beyond the intensity of extreme storms, the other thing to consider is the combination and multiplication of the climate hazards um, occurring over a very short period of time. And this is something that we're also likely to see happening more often in the near future. Thank you. And um, Gavin Chanik, you're at COP at the moment, and so is Chris. That's fantastic. So what's the buzz around Digital Twins there at the moment? Is it lots of unicorns and some good answers? Can you give us a bit of insight? Yeah, well, welcome everybody from a uh, surprisingly sunny Glasgow. Um, uh, in COP, which is uh, remarkably busy, um, and the queues for the coffee are quite abnormally large, um, there are a number of um, high-level meetings, which we've all heard about, uh, but there's also uh, country pavilions and side meetings. And throughout a number of those that I uh, participated in yesterday, there was a real understanding that increasingly data and information is going to be key in uh, both mitigating climate change, but also in adapting and, and improving resilience. And I think um, I, there's a beginning uh, of an understanding as well that actually data in isolation for isolated systems is good and, and making progress and that will certainly be a positive, but it's actually bringing that data together um, in uh, digital twins um, that is going to be really the thing that propels us in able to um, enhance resilience to climate change. So I was in a number of uh, meetings conversations yesterday where uh, maybe the term digital twins wasn't used but that's exactly what people were talking about. Um, it is our job and my job I guess over the next couple of weeks to uh, to um, mention digital twins and introduce them uh, as often as possible. But I think that it is something that is uh, increasingly getting prominence is uh, actually how we bring together data and information and then crucially what we do with it when we integrate it to actually produce decision ready information and that can be used for decision support by uh, policymakers, business and, and different audiences. And that's something that I think is uh, gonna be a, an increasingly important theme both at COP and, and uh, after COP um, when we really have to um, embed uh, data, digital twins, information and data sharing in developing pathways to net zero and also includes, uh, increasing our resilience to uh, changes in the climate. Brilliant. And Chris, staying with your, yourself in COP as well, do we have the climate data available to input to DTs like Credo? So for the Credo project, we're using the UK climate projections produced by the Met Office, which I think are generally regarded as being the gold standard in, in the UK for this kind of study. And I think one of the big contributions we can make in, in Credo uh, is in providing a case study of how climate data like that uh, produced by climate models can be used well in this kind of decision support study. And then, of course, as Gavin, as Gavin says, as, uh, as well as the uh, interoperability of data between uh, the three asset owners, one of the reasons why uh, the why climate resilience is such a, uh, a, a good topic for uh, a case study on digital twins, as well as its societal importance, is that uh, another aspect of data interoperability is linking, is precisely linking climate data into uh, this kind of study. Um, and look, looking looking further forward, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why we're <coughs> I mean, one 
the way that we'll be able to produce this case study is that we have a team of uh, essentially ultra specialists in relevant areas in uh, climate data and decision analysis and, and so on uh, in the Credo team um, and uh, working on a single annual cycle project. Uh, so we, in a sense, we're doing in that sense, we're doing this for real and we can then provide a case study of how other people can uh, do this for real in a wider range of organizations. Looking to the future a bit, there's, uh, we can't do everything in single annual cycles. So looking to, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, other areas which could be developed further, uh, looking to innovation timelines of say a couple of years, uh, one area we might think of is um, uh, development of practice in uh, what, what one does when it's necessary to feed climate scenario data into other very computationally intensive models such as uh, uh, hydrology and flood models uh, in our case. And then looking to the further future on research timelines, there are, uh, there are very practically important research questions around how um, the, the design of uh, of uh, climate projection studies such as UKCP can uh, be developed further to uh, better support uh, this kind of adaptation uh, decision analysis study. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. And to our asset owners, Tom, Matt and Louise, um, what actions can be taken using Credo by asset owners? And are these through Credo, for example, two-way communication? I wonder if um, maybe we'll start with, with Tom, then go to Louise and to Matt. Yeah, sure. Um, so I suppose one of the things to, to maybe stress is that the um, the digital twin is, is a federated digital twin, so we wouldn't be seeing the actual communication if there was any going directly through this central point. Um, but certainly in terms of enabling our individual digital twins, then that, that becomes a discussion internally to the different asset owners whether they want to embrace that kind of uh, opportunity. But I know certainly in terms of the, the um, opportunities, the uh, actions that we could take from the, the uh, minimal viable product that is being developed at the moment, um, that's looking at a more kind of strategic level. So we're looking at um, uh, investment, long-term investment in our infrastructure um, at the most appropriate um, place at the most appropriate time. And the system of systems approach allows us to have those discussions with our, our neighboring asset owners. Uh, and actually whether we could maybe start looking at, um, as, as in fact the, um, the demo uh, shows, whether we can actually start looking at those uh, cross-sector investments to actually make, take, take the best, the most holistic choice um, across the asset owners uh, which hopefully would actually result in, in, in savings, maybe in cost and, and in embodied carbon as well, or indeed operational carbon. So it's, it's those kind of decisions that, uh, from my perspective, I think this particular first step on that journey will help us answer. Brilliant. And um, coming to yourself, Matt, maybe next to answer the same um, question, what actions can be taken using Credo? Yeah, so, so the way I see it, I mean, building on what Tom was describing there, I think there's a longer term aspect to this with respect to... Um, both the, the proactive aspect and then the reactive uh, application of, of the digital twin. So from a proactive perspective, it is about having a better understanding of the need for increased resilience and that interdependence. So by having greater insight into the criticality of third party assets that are dependent on our own, obviously that allows us to be more clear on how critical that asset truly is at a macro level. Um, so therefore in terms of planning, uh, flood defences, for instance, looking at the scenario that we're talking about today, um, but any sort of intervention in the longer term um, is better informed by that, that modelling that we can achieve. Then when you move to more medium to short term forecasting, that's more around event response and planning. So where we have a forecast of a storm coming in, model the, the impact and therefore where do we want to um, increase the operational workforce within a certain location, where do we need to put temporary defences in place and so on. And then ultimately, the, the, the real aspiration here is that real-time aspect that I, I know as people are talking about in the thread around um, what is the net, what are the networks doing here and now? Where have we got uh, point failures? What's the implications of the cascade effect of that? How are we responding? What's the uh, forecast restoration times and so on? That, that um, true near real-time interactivity that allows us to operate and, and restore supplies and, and performance uh, as quickly as possible. Brilliant. And um, finally, same question to yourself, Louise, from BT's perspective. What yeah. actions are you taking? So I'll echo what the um, other guys have said. A lot of it is about um, planning and developing our responses. And, and, you know, a lot of the things we're dealing with are very physical things. You know, we'd, we'd be looking at, do you need new fuel cells at a particular location that, that, for backup resilience purposes? That A lot of the stuff, it, there's a physical aspect that isn't necessarily going to be easily addressed through um, a creator si system. I guess one of the other things I'd sort of quite like to come out from 
credo itself as it stands though is um, some way of expressing and quantifying and showing and demonstrating the benefit that we get from the interconnectivity itself of, of understanding. Because I think that's the thing that will facilitate the data sharing and us being able to get to the sort of, you know, the bigger place where we want to be um, in terms of, um, you know, having more impact and having more joined up systems and processes. Brilliant. Thank you. And um, Sarah, Sarah Hayes, so the Credo Demonstrator is a great first step towards realising the NDP vision, the National Digital Ten Vision. How can we make sure that the data sharing green, uh, agreements and SLAs with regulators are of permanent nature and therefore can be scaled by increasing the participation and the scope? Yes, I think the short answer really is to get the regulators more involved in this. So we want to be able to share the lessons learned from Credo, and one of those lessons is in developing that data license, that data sharing agreement. So being able to make some of these um, documents and um, templates available through the DT Hub in a public way, I think will be really beneficial. Um, and I think more broadly, um, this kind of initiative does need convening. And we would see a role for the regulators to get more involved in this in the future. At the moment, regulators have a view of their own sector. So off what, off gem, off com, think about their own sectors rather than infrastructure system resilience as a whole. Uh, the National Infrastructure Commission previously had made a recommendation that um, the, the regulators should have a duty to think about um, resilience across the system so I, I would see it sort of moving in that direction in the future and it really is how to encourage regulators to think about system resilience rather than sector resilience that's the direction that we would like to take things in and I think credo is a really good demonstration of why we need to think about system resilience rather than just sector resilience so I think it's you know it's back to collaboration isn't it Let, let's build this you know continue to develop credo and get the, the, the regulators involved and, and scale it up Brilliant. And linked to that, there's a great question around uh, the nature of the town chosen and potentially being abstract. I wonder if you could comment a bit around that, because the question is asking, my sense is a made-up town and synthetic data makes the Credo app a bit abstract. A real town or region would be better relatable, maybe a mixture of real and synthetic data, people can relate to it in a, in a different way. So I wonder if you could comment on why particularly we chose uh, anonymized or a fictional town. Sorry, is that that's back to me? Is it? Sorry, it is back to you. Sorry, yeah, sir. Sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we thought about this a lot, and and it would have been much easier to use a real town actually, rather than to have to make up the data. Um, but of course, there are security considerations around showing critical independencies across national infrastructure, um, and we want this to be a very public tool that people can use to show. What, um, you know, what's possible with Credo and how sharing that information can actually help us plan ahead for the future. So um, it, it, in a way then we had to sort of abstract down to a fictional, to, to an, a fictional town to show this. Uh, creating um, an app that represented a region would have been wonderful, but far more time intensive. So in the space of eight weeks, we were able to develop something that shows a town and shows the point. Um, and, and hopefully gets the message across of what this is about. Ultimately, um, in the Credo project, a technical visualization will be produced for the asset owners, which helps them make their own decisions. And of course, that is something that's confidential to, to the asset owners. So it, it really is, you know, it's about sort of showing what is possible and, and what kind of tools might be used by um, different parties in, in the future. I think it's, it's all about, you know, the, showing the art of the possible. Absolutely. That's brilliant. And Robin, back to yourself. <clears throat> Do we have the skills to build to connect digital twins like Credo at scale? Uh, there's an important national conversation around skills happening at the moment. So the, the, the technologies that are built into the Credo approach, um, they are hot technologies, right? We Do we have those? Do we have those? The, the, the number of people needed to tackle this at scale? Well, that's um, that's an ongoing question. Um, I think that what's happening at the moment, um, so UKRI, the National Research Funder, um, is gearing up around this. So we have a bunch of CDTs. 
in, in each of the research councils that really focus on developing the right people to tackle these kinds of problems. Um, it, we're part of that as, as Hartree, so our remit is to, to take these people from, from, um, from their research backgrounds uh, and translate that into, into um, industry and, and the public sector. Um, so Credo shares this, uh, this aim as well, clearly from the organisations that are involved. So the Hartree Centre, um, you know, our mission is, 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 is to, um, uh, to speed up the adoption of these technologies in industry and the public sector. Um, we've recently had a project, uh, a very large programme that's been funded, the Hartree National Centre for Digital Innovation. Uh, a core part of that is a skills development programme. So this isn't just about the technical skills, and this, is, this has been hinted at in a lot of the answers so far. Um, and it, it, is, it is about a culture change in the, the value of, of data, not just in what we can do with it, but, but um, um, you know, what does it mean in terms of how companies relate, how different organisations relate? Um, and, and, and a big part of this is, 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 is upskilling leaders so that they understand this importance. And that's part of the programme that we've got. Now, we're just a small part of that puzzle, but hopefully we can move that on. Um, over the next five years, um, I think that more investment is needed in this. But, um, but, but Credo, hopefully, is, you know, has, the, has started a part of that ongoing conversation, and particularly around digital twinning. Charles, I want to come back to yourself because of your hand from earlier. So maybe wanting to uh, answer one of those earlier questions. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Charles. <laughs> it was an accidental hand. Ah, no problem at all. So I'm going to come to David again. Um, David, so do you think organisations understand the risks of flooding and the potentials of digital twins? Yes, I would say so. So organisations that are providing essential services as power, water, communications, they, they do understand the, the risk to their assets, but the approach they take to, to, to understand and protect their assets is very sectoral. So they're looking at the network alone and the impact that the, any failure of their assets can, can cause to, to their customers. And so the, the way they prioritize investment and they build resilience is very much looking at themselves. They also build some resilience or redundancy in their, in their assets to, to address any potential failures of other sectors they rely on, but they are less aware of those potential failures and how they can, they can be impacted due to them. So that is where Credo can really step in and, and provide that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that new information that can fill that gap. Brilliant. And so Amit, what is Credo going to look like for an end user? What will the interface be and what will it have kind of features wise? Thank you, Simon. It's, it's a good question. I mean, in the current format, uh, it would basically show you, as, as Tom referred to the visualization, where you can see the data being, uh, you can see the assets being affected by the flood levels. Uh, but in future, and, and this is thinking about the future of Credo now, um, we can look at different parallel worlds as well. When we say parallel digital worlds, then different scenario analysis and how to optimize and control the, the current operations all these aspects would be available to the users. Um, and this is thanks to the decentralized and the scalable nature of, of the Credo platform itself. Okay. And um, going to, to Chris, if I could please, Chris Dent. Uh, will the lessons learned from the demonstrator project be published? Or other outputs at all, actually, or which outputs maybe? So, so, I mean, as, as, is, uh, I mean, as is standard with, uh, with um, innovation with a uh, government funded innovation project like this we're committed to publishing more results and going beyond what would conventionally be thought of as the results so the tech the technical results making uh, uh, make, making uh, uh, software tools for certain parts of, uh, of it that people can reuse available we're also looking to share the lessons uh, more uh, in, a, in a wider sense we've already heard a little bit about that in terms of some of the issues around data licensing but there are many other uh, I mean, there are many other aspects of that in terms of how the teams from different disciplines have uh, have worked together uh, so i think the answer is uh, is yes in uh, in the broadest sense Brilliant. 
And um, coming to Tom Collingwood, have, have there been any blockchain methods or data integrity or using DLT at all or token economy to promote data sharing initiatives being explored? Yeah, I was happy I saw this one come up in, in the question. So uh, with another hat on, I, I'm Hartree Centre's blockchain technical specialist. So th this one lies close to my heart in a number of others. Um, there's an interesting application here. So, so the, the short answer is no, not yet. Um, but the longer answer is that the data sharing structures that we're talking about and the, um, the need for both interoperability, but also multi-party provenance, that, that there are definitely overlaps with what blockchain covers here. The use case and the application is it, it remains to be seen because with the three asset owners we currently have, they are driven by their own, the, the incentive is naturally there as the businesses that they run for them to need better information and sharing information more broadly. Um, I don't think we need to incentivize it through something like a token economy. As you move this out more broadly though, and as you go to other industries and as you go to um, you know, SMEs wanting to get involved in a national scale digital twin, there may be an the opportunity to build in some incentivization there. So um, whether that's in data provision or in you know, data cleaning, data validation, but on the way into a national digital twin, there's a huge area of opportunity there for that kind of technology to be used um, to, uh, to share, uh, to, to help spread the share of information, but also to, to get parties behaving in a, in a way that encourages honesty uh, and quality. Brilliant. And to um, Matt Webb, so what other sectors and actors would you like to see be involved in Credo? Um, it's an interesting question because I think we need to be cautious about being too prescriptive. Um, I think as soon as we, we, we do that, we risk limiting the, the potential benefits. So there's obviously the, the obvious natural expansion to other infrastructure owners and, and uh, utilities. Uh, building off of the, the, the three core participants we've got through this early phase uh, so that we aim for um, denser regional coverage and ideally national coverage on, on the longer term. Uh, but equally, uh, I think it's also important to recognise the potential for um, other data owners to, to participate. You know, we, we have the ability to, to create digital twins right down at an individual asset level. So the, the potential expansion and extension out into all areas across both the, the private and public sector is, is almost limitless. So um, I think we need to be sensible and recognize the first step is to focus on utilities and infrastructure, but with the aspiration of, of you know, pushing out in any direction where uh, an opportunity presents itself. Brilliant, thank you. And to Gavin Shaddock, um, are there digital twin use cases for energy demand and carbon emissions as part of the program? And linked to that, if a sustainability DT is developed to predict energy and water demand and carbon emissions, for example, for a group of buildings, how will the handshake with the National Digital Twin Programme be done? That's a, a really interesting question. I think the idea of a kind of sustainability digital twin that, uh, as the question says, brings into account um, energy demands, water usage, uh, I would also uh, carbon emissions, but I would also include in that uh, the changes in those uh, with climate change, as we might experience hotter winters, uh, wetter summers, um, so that we can make sure that things are robust, not just now, but actually in the future. So I think that there is massive scope for using digital twin technology uh, to really explore this space. And it's worth, probably worth saying that uh, within Credo, we have uh, concentrated on one specific use case, which is uh, climate projections through mapping to flooding and then looking at the uh, effects on um, assets. Um, but the actual underlying uh, data interoperability and in the information management uh, framework is the thing that will be transferable to other digital twins. And, and if we thought about that sustainability digital twin, I think a lot of the work that's gone into uh, credo in the kind of underlying technology is directly transferable and that's going to make building future digital twins much easier in the future um, both from the kind of technological point of view but I think uh, going back to what many people have said the kind of learning in the non-technical aspects the the need for data sharing agreements how they're formulated uh, how to involve 
um, all, uh, all the people in what is a very wide and interdisciplinary group from asset owners to very technical uh, expertise and everything in between uh, to bring all that together. And I think Tom at some point is going to get a question on how you manage such a, a widely spread uh, team from different disciplines. So I think, um, to my mind, Credo uh, is not just doing important work in the kind of climate resilience and flooding space, but actually it's that underlying bringing people together bringing uh, data together um, and models as well in a way that uh, should transfer to other things. And I, I, I have to say, I think the idea of a digital twin for sustainability that integrates future demand in energy uh, uh, with emissions and buildings is something that, that really is A, needed, uh, and B, is something that would uh, be incredibly uh, important in the future. Brilliant, thank you. And I, mean, I see your hands there, so one of the uh, Yeah. Um, so just to add to add to that point, I think sustainability comes naturally to Credo, and and this is uh, because if you look at say you, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, then we can track these as part of the knowledge graph, and we are we actually doing this actively at CMCL, and and we bring the same skill set here uh, with with the rest of the team. Uh, so I, I think sustainability comes naturally, and we don't have to track one of the SDGs or, or two of the SDGs. With the decentralized and graphical approach, we can track all of them simultaneously. And we are not in any way saying that UNSDG is the way forward, but at least something quantitatively where we can measure impact on sustainability. And this is built in by design. Thank you. And to Gavin Starks, please. So Gavin Shalek's earlier statement about the role of data more broadly in climate adaptation and mitigation. I wonder what your reflections were potentially on how we can make that, uh, how data can better help us in climate emergencies from your perspective. Yeah, well, I think on many fronts here, I think we're just at the very beginning of what's going to be a fantastically exciting journey. I think we're going to see an exponential uh, growth in data sharing around all of these areas. The number of users is also going to increase dramatically, ranging from people on the ground trying to make uh, local planning decisions about their own environment through to our infrastructure providers, but also right the way through to the financial community. Uh, we're already seeing insurers, uh, asset managers, uh, and funders looking for more information about the climate risk uh, around assets in the built world and uh, shaping their investment strategies accordingly. So you're starting to see the, the need for this level of information from multiple sources. Uh, so that how this can all get fed together and, and be um, cohesive again across these uh, different projects, different initiatives, different sectors, different regulators, it's a heavy lifting job and it's gonna require a hell of a lot of um, collaboration between organizations that have never worked together uh, before. I think the benefits here is we'll end up uh, in a situation where we can better model uh, what we've got and better invest in radically increasing the resilience uh, of our uh, existing infrastructure and helping to invest in low carbon uh, technologies and solutions as we move forward. Brilliant. Coming to our final questions here, so to Charles, what do you think is the role of GIS in connecting digital twins and improving infrastructure system resilience? Um, I think the, the primary role of, of GIS is to provide an index of all the digital twins which are available. There's a lot of questions coming through about the scalability of the digital twin and applying it to wider regions and so on. And what you need is a way of identifying what digital twins are available, small scale ones, large scale ones, infrastructure twins, individual bridge twins, and linking them together, it provides an index basically that allows us to structure and organize and support a federated model. Um, so I think that's its primary role. It simply is the glue that ties these things together. Brilliant, thank you. And our final question here, um, before we come to the end of our webinar, we'll hand over to Mark, is um, to Audrey. It seems that Credo has integrated a wide array of fixed asset data. For me, a digital twin integrates fixed data with sensory data. Does the present model combine any real-time or right-time data for example, water level measurements. So, is it for the sorry for the is it for the public visualization tool that we're talking about, or for the technical work that is? Uh, let's let's answer both in in general. Let's say. So, 
at the moment for the public visualization tool, there hasn't been any real-time data like early warning system or water level measurement that has fed into the tool as being based purely on, on fictional, um, fictional flood extents uh, data. Brilliant, thank you. So that's all we've got time for, sadly, with all the questions. There's a couple others in the chat that we weren't able to get to, and I'm really sorry for that. We're just slightly limited on time and uh, about 34 questions plus others we've asked um, in parallel as well. But thank you all to all our panelists. Really, really appreciate that. Most, um, most thankful for your answers there. And what I'm going to do next is hand over to Mark Enns, if I could, please. You can wrap up today's webinar and talk, give a few words about um, next steps. So, Mark, over to you. Simon, thank you very much indeed. And, and thank you to the panel. That, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, you got through so many questions and, and such interesting stuff. Um, so, so where I want to get to on, on this, and I've only got a few, few minutes, is, is really to, to say thanks. Uh, so I will get back to that. But before I do, there's just a couple of things I wanted to, to, to pick up on that have, have come out throughout the, uh, the session. Uh, and, and I guess um, that kind of the, the highlight, the high level thing, is this thing about collaboration through connected digital twins um, is, is key to, uh, to climate change. And I, I think the thing is that um, what we're doing here uh, during uh, COP26 uh, is adding something of genuine value to the climate change agenda. Uh, you, you, we need to, to do this in order to address, address climate change. It's just um, that straightforward. Uh, but it's also a really good demonstrator of the national digital twin. Uh, and we, we realised from quite early on that we needed a tangible working example of the national digital twin to, to help people see what, what on earth it's all about. Uh, and this just gives a perfect example of it, something that really matters. Uh, and I think that in what we've seen with the film, but also in the app, what we've heard about with the technical work, uh, we can see something which is really nicely connected. Uh, and so with the film, uh, I'm amazed at just uh, how much of an emotional punch it gives in just six minutes, uh, but it's accessible. It's something that people can, uh, can easily understand. Uh, you, know, you, you don't need to be an expert to understand what that's all about. And that is fantastic. It's getting the message across to, to anybody. But also with the app, uh, we, we can have a go. Uh, we can uh, do something which is interactive and we can kind of dig in a little bit more uh, and understand a different level uh, of this. Uh, and then also what Tom was sharing uh, about the kind of the, the deep technical level, the kind of the core foundational stuff, uh, which he, he said was kind of out of sight, but is, is kind of more than 90% of, of what uh, Credo is all about. Um, that is, uh, another level where we need to be communicating. So I think at that deep technical level, we need to show that it's possible, that this thing can actually work. Uh, at the kind of domain level of the, um, of the asset owners, we need to show um, that it's meaningful, that it, it, it really matters uh, and it can make better decisions that benefit people. Uh, and then I think at the higher level, kind of the public level, we need to get across this thing that it's necessary, that we want this, you know, that we the people want this to happen uh, because it's going to help us. So I think it's fantastic to see how really connected uh, all of this is. Uh, and I think uh, just looking at this, it's it's a, a important way marker. There's a long way to go, but this is a really important way marker uh, in Credo. And I think it's just fantastic uh, to see how far the team has gone. So what, what I'd like to finish off on uh, very briefly is to, uh, to, to thank the team for, for getting this far. You, thank you very much, Simon, for your brilliant comparing, as always. Every Tuesday, you're brilliant, but you're brilliant today. Uh, the, the panelists, really thoughtful answers to the questions. Really want to thank uh, Rachel and Kirsten, who've done a huge amount of work in the background to uh, organise this seminar, uh, to get it to work so, so well. Uh, and then I want to really pay a particular recognition to Sarah, who's led the team. Uh, she always knew that we needed to have a demonstrator right back from when she was working in the National Infrastructure Commission, came up with that report, Data for the Public Good, right from the beginning. She's always known that we need a demonstrator. And I think that uh, what she and the team are coming up with now on this particular demonstrator uh, it is probably the perfect example of a demonstrator because it really matters. It's meaningful and it, it, you know, it matters right now for what we're going through in relation to, to climate change. Uh, so, yeah, we just need to, to remember, don't we, that uh, collaboration through connected digital twins 
is key to tackling climate change. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. And also, finally, I thank you to all of you, our attendees, for joining us today on this webinar. And the really exciting is we've just hit 12 o'clock, so it is now live. The uh, video and, or, sorry, not the video, the absolute film and the app are now accessible for the world to see. So I really encourage you to go on to that URL on screen here, the DC hub slash credo hyphen film, share with your networks, publicize this, get it out there, because whilst it's an emotional film, it also really, really hits the key point that we need to do this together in collaboration. So thanks again for joining us. For those of you who um, would be interested in joining more of these sessions, every Tuesday, the program hosts a Gemini call as we term it the stand up where we give more information for half an hour about everything that's happening within the program, along with updates on credo itself. So please join us for that on Tuesday. Thank you again for coming and hopefully see you in the future.